Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thank you for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're deeply privileged to be joined by one of my favorite historians and really one of the most popular and respected historians in the world, Margaret McMillan. Uh, Margaret is a professor um, at the University of Toronto and also Oxford, which is where she is joining us. She's written a number of just wonderful books, including that my bookshelf is packed with Margaret McMillan books, but one of my all time favorite is Paris 1919, which is about the peace conference uh, following World War I. And her current book, which has just come out in the last month or so, is War, which we will talk about. It's very, very interesting and, and provocative. And I will say for those of you who follow sports, uh, Margaret McMillan is sort of the LeBron James or Michael Jordan, or maybe even the Wayne Gretzky of contemporary historians. I needed to throw in a Canadian reference there for Professor McMillan. So Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm absolutely delighted. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but COVID's made the world a different place. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, uh, as I had mentioned, Margaret is joining us from, from Oxford, where she has an academic affiliation. Well, Margaret, I saw an interview you did uh, some years ago in which you were asked about your interest in history. And you were somewhat playfully said that, you know, as a young girl, your interests were, were history and figure skating and ballet, and ultimately history prevailed. How, how, did, how did history win out, 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 out of those other uh, uh, hobbies? Well, it's, it's partly a process of elimination. And if you're six feet tall, which I am, then figure skating is not for you. Um, <laughs> if you don't have a good sense of balance, uh, neither figure skating or ballet are good for you. And I was very lucky. I mean, early on, I found that I loved history. I've never been bored by it. I've spent my life doing it and I hope to go on doing it. And you have, you have mentioned that um, the, the thing about history that really pulls you in, I mean, obviously, the, the, the kind of the, the challenge of, of understanding different times, the challenge of understanding different people and their motivations. But you also have talked about just kind of the fun aspect of being able to, as you put it, read other people's mail and diaries. I mean, tell us what it is about history that really gra grabs you. Well, it is partly that, the, the sort of what was it like then and what were those people like and what did they eat and they wear, what did they wear, what did they think about things, what did, did they get upset about, what did they love. And you do, in a way, behave with people in the past in ways you couldn't behave in, in, in the present. I mean, you don't read people's emails unless they ask you, you don't read people's letters and you don't read people's private diaries, but you can read it from the past. And I think Curiosity drives a lot of historians. I mean, we, we are interested, of course, in how we got here and, and how history developed and, and the great forces in history. But I think a lot of us are also interested in the people, the people who were affected by history or who affected it. And so it's an endlessly, to me, interesting subject. And, and the lovely thing about history is you never run out of new eras to look into or, or new parts of the world to get interested in. I read one uh, essay you wrote in which you said there is a particular pl pleasure in hearing a voice which re reaches across the decades and reminds us that we share a common humanity. We read the great diarists because we find them such entertaining and interesting individuals. I think that, yes, there is something. And, and I know they're not like us. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I know that someone who lived 300 years ago, 400 years ago is not like me. But there are these moments and you think, yes, but they were human too. I mean, one of the things I read a, a few years ago, which I loved, was the diary of, of a, he started out a rather obscure pre, a prince in, in, in the wild parts of, of Central Asia, descendant of, of Genghis Khan, actually, a man called Babur. And he was kicked out of his little principality when he was about 15 and he wandered around. And he kept a diary. And he sounded at times so much like a young man in the present, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm fed up with this. I'm so depressed. And, and then he talks about having a wonderful night with his friends gambling and it was such fun. And, you know, I probably drank too much. He went on to found the Mughal dynasty in India, but it's this voice. And you think, yes, he was a ferocious soldier and he was someone who did found a dynasty and conquered an empire, but he was also this intensely human person. And, in, you know, so few rulers at the time kept diaries. I mean, it was just extraordinary that this one survived, but it's fascinating. And you do, you do get that sense of somehow you, 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 there's a contact there. 
Well, you, as your career began, you know, you were a teacher. And as we were talking about before we started, your initial teaching assignments were to students who are maybe not necessarily historians. And so it posed a, a special challenge for you in the way you taught history. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I was teaching students who were going to going into the professions of various sorts. So I was teaching engineers. They all had to do a liberal arts. And so they often came to history rather reluctantly um, and they weren't all that keen on writing essays. But I taught engineers. I taught business students. I taught journalism students. I taught nurses. And if I could get through to them, it was it was very exciting. And so I learned, I think, how to tell stories and I learned how to get them interested and my, one of my sort of breakthroughs, I remember I was teaching people who were going to be um, city engineers. And one of them, I gave a lecture, I think, on Napoleon. And one of them came up at the end and he said, that was really interesting. He said, I liked it much more than the class I went to this morning. And I said, what was the class this morning? He said, it was industrial sludge. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I really made it. But, but you know, there is that, that six, you know, that, that uh, you do get a sense and you must have felt this if, if you know, when, as when you were a journalist or when you, when you're now at the university, when you get through to someone and they see the point and they get interested in history. And some of my students did go on and become very interested in history. Right. Well, one of your, your first books, in fact, I think it was your fir first book was called w Women of the Raj, which was about uh, the women in the British Empire in, in England. And I, I saw, excuse me, in India. And I, I saw you in an interview say that the, the idea for the book hit you during a concert. Tell us about that moment and how that creative process began. Well, it, how the subconscious works is very odd, and I don't quite know how it does, but sometimes things float out. I, I think of my subconscious like a sort of terrible sort of dark soup with bits floating around it, and something will come to the surface, and I'll think, I realize I've been thinking about it for a bit, but hadn't really sort of fully realized it. And I was sitting in a very nice classical music concert in Toronto, and it was a time in the, in the 70s when women's history was becoming a subject. And so I'd been reading quite a bit of women's history, was interested in it, and I had also done my thesis on the British in India. And I was sort of thinking, sort of, I must have been mulling it over. And suddenly in the concert, I thought, why don't I write a book about the British women in India so I can combine two sorts of things I'm interested in? And so that was the origin of my first book. Well, the, the book that you became, you know, an internationally well acclaimed and, and well known was the one that I had cited, uh, Paris 1919. And, uh, you know, the book is a wonderful account of, of the, the negotiations after World War One and just really is, provides a, a insight as to the world that resulted. But I was particularly interested in just your, your, your journey in writing this book, because as I understand it, it was a 10 plus year ordeal you had a number of publishers turn you down. Tell us about just what drove you during that time and, and just the process of putting together a book that became such a spectacular success. Well, it was accident, I think. Um, and it, it became a, a passion, um, I suppose. I mean, I was teaching a lot of, of 20th century history. And so I would often come across the Paris Peace Conference, which was the big peace conference held at the end of the First World War. And so many things that I was teaching about had been discussed there. So I'd be talking about um, you know, colonies in Africa and I'd realized that that was discussed in Paris or I'd be talking about international relations and I realized that the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations had come out of that. Or I'd be talking later on about the breakup of Yugoslavia and I realized Yugoslavia was created at the time of the Paris Peace Conference. So lots of things sort of came together and, and the settlement in the Middle East was, was a product, the borders in the Middle East were the product of, of the Paris Peace Conference. So I thought this would make a really good book. And there were so many interesting people there. I mean, it's hard now to imagine an international meeting where the heads of some of the most important countries of the world sit in one place for six months talking to each other. So Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States, Georges Clemenceau, the prime minister of France, David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Britain, the Prime Minister of Italy, the Prime Minister of Belgium, you know, the Prime Minister, you know, it was this extraordinary concentration of people, plus all sorts of people who were going to become famous later on, like Ho Chi Minh, um, who, who led Vietnam to independence. And so I thought this is both an interesting and important event, but it's a great story. And so I just, I, be, I just, I had a wonderful time. I read memoirs, I went and looked in archives and I then tried, as you say, to find publishers. And I got, I, I found a file the other day of, of rejection letters. Um, and I often say to young writers, you do get rejected. And, and one said, um, nobody wants to read about a, a bunch of dead white men sitting around a table talking about peace treaties. And so I did persist and luckily, finally, I wrote bits of it. And then finally I found a publisher 
And it happened at a time, it, it came out just at the beginning of the 21st century, this century. And it was a time when the Middle East was becoming an issue again, when Yugoslavia had just fallen to pieces and people were saying, how did this all start? And so I think I was very lucky in my timing because my book, I think, helped to explain how a lot of the problems of the 20th and 21st centuries started and were talked about. And I think I saw an interview where you were like on a hiking trip, maybe it was in, in the Rockies or something. So you'd been kind of out of touch with people for a while. And when you returned, uh, you heard word that it had gotten a, a very favorable review and maybe the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and it's kind of exploded onto yeah. the, uh, the stage. Yeah, no, I was in a remote, well, I was in the Rockies and in those days we, it was in the back country and you hiked in and there were no mobile telephones. I'm not even sure they still work there. There was one radio, but that was a sort of three hour hike down a valley. So you basically had no contact with the outside world. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, I hope, I hope someone reviews my book, you know, even a, just one of those little reviews would be nice, just, you know, among interesting new books is, and I came back out and there were sort of phone messages for me and people trying to get hold of me saying, you've just had, I, I had a very good review in, in one of the leading English newspapers. And I was bowled over. I mean, I didn't think this was going to happen, but it, it just, and I think, as I say, I think it was partly the timing. My book sort of came at the right time when people were worrying about how the world got to be where it was. Now, you, one of the, the, the books that I, I loved, uh, which is, I think, based on some, some talks you gave, is called Dangerous Games, the, abuse, the, the Use and Abuse of History. And you, you describe the importance of history, but also the limitations of history, and talk a lot about how policymakers can use history, but they should do so carefully. Develop your thoughts on that. Well, I think, you know, the danger of history is, is when people regard it as something that gives you a set of clear instructions. I mean, history is not a cook recipe in a cookbook. You know, do this and you'll get the following result. What history can do is open your mind and offer, offer possibilities. But it's when policymakers say, you know, we're going to follow the rules of history. And that can be dangerous. Um, I think, you know, that, that quite a few governments, including the American government, got themselves into trouble in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, by thinking that we have to avoid the mistakes that people made in the 1930s by not being tough enough with dictators. And so the British government tried to invade Egypt in 1954 and overthrow Nasser, the, the Egyptian president, because they thought he was like Mussolini or Hitler, and he wasn't. And it was a bit, you know, it caused all sorts of trouble. So I think try, following history too closely can be dangerous. And I think, of course, we've also seen how populist leaders will use history to stir up stories for their own people to make them feel aggrieved and also to point to enemies. And so it can be dangerous. I th that's why I called it dangerous games, because it can be very dangerous. But I think what history can do is instruct us, as, as, as a great historian called Timothy Snyder said, it, it can give us warnings. It can give us ways of thinking about the present. It can help us ask questions. So it's not going to give us the answers, but it's going to help us ask good questions. And it's going to say things. It'll say things like, um, if you want to invade and occupy Iraq, you should know something of its history because the Iraqis tend not to like outsiders coming in. And they, that the British had this problem when they went into Iraq in, in 1920. They had to deal with a huge rebellion, indeed, in many of the same areas that, that, that then caused trouble of course, later on after the invasion and occupation in, 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 in this century. And so what it can do is say, just watch it. You're going to run into trouble if you try and do this. Well, in fact, I, at one point you said, uh, the study of history is useful if it does nothing more than teach us humility. Yeah, well, that's not a bad thing, is it? I mean, I think what history can also do, I mean, among, among the sort of useful sort of reminders it can give us is that the past is full of people who were very clever, and very powerful and had all sources of information and thought they knew everything and they came a cropper. And that's worth remembering, you know, that we may think we're very clever right now. We may think people in the past were, were, didn't know what they were doing. There were lots of people in the past who thought they knew exactly what they were doing and they got into terrible trouble. So I think a bit of humility, um, both among those of us who are citizens, but also among our leaders is not a bad thing. Well, let's talk about your book, War. And um, it began, I, I, as I gather, a, a, a series of lectures you gave in 2018 um, called The Mark of Cain, I think was the theme of the, of the lectures. And I'm interested, as you were preparing the lectures and then as the book, how do you begin to 
research and think about war. I mean, it such, seems such an, a massive and almost amorphous to topic. I mean, how do you find entry into a topic that huge? Well, there were times when I thought, what have I done and why did I take this on? But I've been thinking on and off about war for most of my career. I mean, if you are an historian of the 19th and 20th centuries, which I am, then war plays a very large part, particularly in the 20th century. It, it's hard to get away from, from thinking about war. And I used to teach a course actually in my first university in war and society, the ways in which war affected society and the ways in which society affected war. And so it was something that I've always been interested in but never focused on. And when I was asked to give these lectures for the British Broadcasting Corporation, I had to give five of them. And I thought, well, I'll take it up now because it'll force me to, to read and think more about it. And so I did, and, and it was very helpful to do the lectures and then hear people's questions because I got a sense of things I didn't know too. And then I took two years to write the book and I did read a lot, but no, the subject is huge and I certainly haven't read everything. Well, I want to just uh, quote one, one thing you say early in the book. You say, I hope to persuade you of one thing. War is not, an is not an aberration best forgotten as quickly as possible, nor is it simply an absence of peace, which is really the normal state of affairs. If we fail to grasp how deeply intertwined war and human society are to the point that we cannot say that one predominates or causes the other, we are missing an important dimension of the human story. We cannot ignore war and its impact on the development of human society. Well, that's what I feel. And, and of course, people should feel free to disagree with me. But I think what war has done is shaped our societies, has made a difference in, in the way certain things have turned out. I mean, you know, imagine if the Allies hadn't won the Second World War, we'd be living in a very different world indeed, and, and, and a horrible world, I suspect. But... I think it's not just that. I think war is something that has helped to promote organization. Governments have, have often become stronger and more organized and develop bigger bureaucracies because of the need to organize for war and, and, and extract resources from society. And I think, you know, it, it, war is a subject that, that I think a lot of us find distasteful, although a lot of people find it fascinating. And we, a lot of us in the West have lived in, in what people call the long peace since 1945. Very few people living in Western countries have experienced war directly. And when wars have occurred since 1945, they've happened outside the developed world. They've happened elsewhere, even though sometimes soldiers from the developed world have gone. And so I think perhaps we've got into the way of thinking that war is something that doesn't happen, shouldn't happen. And as, 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 as you quoted me, an aberration and I think we need to take it seriously, partly to understand again how human history developed, but also because if we don't think about it and we don't think about how to stop it and we don't think about how it starts and, and reasons why it might start, then we always run the risk of, of blundering into it. And you know, for a lot of the world, there hasn't been peace since 1945. I mean, there has been one war in one or other part of the world pretty much every year and sometimes more than one war since 1945. And a great many people have died as a result of war and are still dying. And a great many people have become refugees as a result of war. And, you know, we, at the moment, we have three or four or five wars going on in the world. And, and so I think we need to take it seriously because otherwise we, 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 may, we, may, we may find ourselves getting ourselves in, into trouble. Well, early in the book, you raise a profound question, which is, are we genetically programmed to fight? Is, is war just in man's DNA? Yeah. I don't think so. I and mean, this is a long debate among those who, who, who consider war. And I don't think evolution has left us with a biology that is prone to war. Um, we have a propensity perhaps to lash out when we're afraid. And that probably does come from, from millennia of evolution. Um, but war actually is very controlled and very organized, although, of course, it uses violence. And so I don't define war as something that just two people get angry and start punching each other or start you know, trying to hurt each other. That's not what war is. War is organized. An anthropologist said to me, it's probably the most organized of all human activities when you think of the ways, because war is between groups. It's not just between individuals. And when you think of what it takes to get a group together, to, to get it ready to fight, to train it, to provide it with the equipment it needs, that takes a lot of organization. And so my own view, is that whatever biological impulses we may have as a result of evolution, in fact, we fight because 
of culture. We fight because we're organized in ways or we're, we're, we're primed in ways through our culture to think that war is something we can use. Or sometimes we fight because we feel we have no choice. But I think why we fight is, is really much more a product of culture than biology. In the book, you, you, you cite the, the famous comment by Robert E. Lee, I think at Fredericksburg, in which he said he's watching, I think, a battle unfold. And he says, it's well that war is so terrible or we should grow too fond of it. Yeah. What do you think he meant by that? I've always been struggling to deconstruct yeah. exactly what he was yeah. getting at. Well, what I think, um, but I may be wrong, but what I think is that you know there is this side of war. I mean, war brings out the cruelest side in human nature, but it also brings out the best. It can bring out the most noble side. I mean, you will get people who will die for others in a war, will sacrifice for others in a war, will we'll protect others in a war. And there is also this, this the, the glory of war. There is something about, and, and you know, we look at our monuments, we look at some of our great works of literature, great paintings, um, movies. You know, there is something that we admire about war and, and we can see as noble and heroic. And Robert E. Lee was, you know, of course, trained at West Point. He, he grew up in this tradition that they all read about the great wars of the past. They read about the Greek and the Roman wars, and they read about those great heroes. And I think there is a side of us, certainly, and I think Robert E. Lee was, was perhaps expressing that, which finds war as something glorious and that war has an attraction. And so I, I'm guessing, I mean, I, I don't know if that's what he meant, but so many people who have been at war say you, you, there is that side. When you talk, I know you know you're on kind of a Zoom a book tour, but what are, what are the sort of the, the kind of the perennial questions about war that you get? I mean, what is the one question that always is is uh, is put to you during your your talk? Um, well, one I get often, um, I get several, but one I often get is, "Wouldn't the world be nicer if women ran it?" Um, and my short answer is just to list all the women who have been quite formidable, like Margaret Thatcher. Um, Indira Gandhi, Catherine the Great, um, who certainly did not shrink from war. And my longer answer is that, um, you know, although most of those who have fought, probably 99% or more who have fought in the past have been men, women have shown themselves capable of fighting and accepting military discipline, and they are in, in military roles today. So that's one question I get um, quite often. Well, let's if we could talk for a couple of minutes about COVID and, and, and history and how to how to process what's going on now. I guess the first question is, I, I know we're right in the middle of a, you know, this this seismic event and it's very, very difficult to put it into perspective. But do you accept this sort of view that this is one of, you know, a, a, an event of just stunning magnitude? I mean, of course, quarter million people died in the U.S., you know, alone. So that suggests one answer to that. But do you have a sense of just what its historical importance is likely to be seen as? I can guess. I mean, historians, as you know, are always very reluctant to talk about their own times or, or make any predictions about the future. But it seems to me this is a catastrophe for societies and it's a global catastrophe. And it's not just those who are dying and who are falling ill and who many, many of whom are suffering long term consequences. But it's the impact on our economies. It's the impact on our young people who, who are not able to get on with their lives and their careers or their educations. It's the impact on international relations. Um, you know, I think it's been very unfortunate that countries have been blaming each other for the COVID when you know, a pandemic's a pandemic. I mean, it's, it, it's not something that is caused by one country or one people or another. And so I do think it is a catastrophe on a scale like the Black Death in Europe in the 15th century. Um, and the, uh, the waves of the Black Death that, of course, affected not just Europe, but Central Asia, um, parts of the Far East, and, and continued to flare up until late into the 19th century. It's a catastrophe as well, I think, like a great economic crash, like the Great Depression, or it's a catastrophe on, on the order of world wars. And all of these things challenge societies. And sometimes societies cannot cope with the challenges, and sometimes they can. But I think if you look back through history, there have been these massive challenges to the established order and, and to the leaders and to the people. And they can be anything, as I say, from a, a major war to something like a pandemic, but they're on the order of really 
demanding a response from societies and, and, and threatening some of the things that hold societies together. Well, how do you think a historically um, a curious policymaker, whether it be the president of the United States or the prime minister of Canada or the chancellor of Germany, how would they use history? How could they use history to help formulate their response to COVID? Well, what they might ask, and they could also ask about the present, is which societies managed these crises best and how did they manage it best? And what seems to me comes out from the past is the societies that manage best often had leadership that took responsibility and was able to do so. But also the societies that in many cases seem to manage best were societies in which people came together to try and deal with the crisis. And I mean, what's been very encouraging in this particular crisis is how much, I mean, there has been both good and bad leadership as, as always happens, but also how much people at the local level have come together and tried to help each other out. And I do think that when you have societies with a tradition or expectation of helping each other, where they are neighbors to each other and, and will come together. And sometimes even when you don't have that tradition, it, it can suddenly appear. I think those are the societies on the whole that cope best. And I think when you have societies that come out of these crises, crises and say, what have we learned? Because you, know, you don't wanna just come out of a major crisis and say, well, that's that. Because you know, for sure, sooner or later, there's gonna be another crisis. And so for looking into the future, I'd like to think that societies that have been badly hit by the pandemic and, and every society in the world has been hit one way or another, although some have got off relatively lightly, such as New Zealand or, or Iceland, partly because they're islands, but partly because they've also, I think, taken measures. If they can come out of the crisis and say, what did we learn? And what should we prepare for next time? Because you know, there will be a next time. Um, you know, that, that is, I think, evident from history. There, it may not be a pandemic again, although I think that is probably highly likely, um, but there may be another economic crisis, there may be another catastrophe like a, like a the sudden climate change. And so societies that can cope during the crisis, but can also learn from it, I think are the ones that will probably do best. Some writers here have talked about, have linked the pandemic with the, the racial tensions and the racial struggle, and they've referred to kind of the twin pandemics, you know, gripping American society. Do you think those kind of analogies, do you think they illuminate or do you think they conflate, you know, two very separate occurrences in a way that maybe has a literary appeal, but doesn't really tell you very much? I, I think I think that there is both connection and coincidence. And I think the connection is that in many countries, those who are the poorer members of society who live in the most crowded conditions have been most vulnerable. And being poor and living in crowded conditions often is tied to particular ethnicities for various historical reasons. I mean, in the United Kingdom where I am now, um, cities in the North which have high concentrations of immigrants from Pakistan and India have often suffered higher rates, partly because they're, they don't have, you know, they tend to live together in multi multi generational households, and they have um, deprived living conditions. Their health isn't good anyway, and so I think that is the that is the connection. The coincidence, I think, is that often you get things happening at the same time in societies which aren't caused by each other, but tend to interact with each other and, and magnify the effect. And so I think the United States, as you know better than me, has had racial tensions for much of its history, which at certain times are more acute than others. And I think those racial tensions were probably high anyway before the pandemic hit because there was concern about what was happening to black people being, uh, black people being arrested by the police, the, the, the deaths of black people. So I think that would have happened anyway but the, since the pandemic was also happening, it, it tended to make it even more acute and, and perhaps magnify it. So sometimes they're connections, but sometimes things just happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then we get a sense that everything is, 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 is falling to pieces. I wonder if we could talk for a few minutes about the, the, your, the, your profession, the, uh, the profession of the historian. And it seems like there's two sort of contradictory things going on. On the one hand, at least in the United States, and I'm sure in Canada and the UK and elsewhere, you know, history books are very popular, uh, flying off the bookshelves, et cetera. 
And yet many of them are written by uh, non-trained historians. Um, and, you know, many of them are journalists. And I'm wondering, I, I know you've written a lot about just the imperative of, his, of historians to, to present your work to the general public, to, to write in a way that people understand. And you've been critical that, that too, time, too often academic historians get caught in kind of a bubble where they're speaking in a specialized language and writing only to each other. Tell me how you think things look right now from this, the sense of a, a historian. Um, I think, well, I've always thought that we should write for general public. And, and when I was taught, the people who taught me both at the University of Toronto and Oxford wrote clear prose and wrote in ways that were understandable to anyone who was interested. You know, they, they didn't dumb it down, but they wrote in ways that if you picked up their books, you, you could be interested in it. And I think history has become more and more concerned or his, history departments have become many of them more and more concerned with sounding like political scientists. Political scientists want to be like economists. Economists want to be like scientists. And so there is this sort of uh, stress, I think, on, on a, a particular language and writing in a particular way. And I think it's a shame. I mean, I know you, you know, sometimes you write for, for academic journals and you're writing about a complex subject which you have to use particular words in. But I think for the most part, we should be writing in ways that, that are clear. And so I know I'm concerned about the history profession. I think perhaps more in North America than in, in the UK where historians still are taught to write clearly and, and it's seen that they, they do have an obligation to communicate with the public. Um, you know, I think sometimes there's an attitude in North American universities, certainly in Canada, that if you write for, for the public, you're popularizing history, you're dumbing it down. Um, I've been criticized by this, and I, I remember a review once which said, oh, she does nothing but tell stories. And I thought, well, telling stories isn't so bad, actually. You, it, let's talk a little bit about your work in terms of just how you do it. And I saw one interview where you say when you get kind of zoned in on a subject, it's like you're retreating into a one person monastery. Um, to talk about the research challenge. And I, we were talking uh, before uh, about Barbara Tuckman, and I came across a comment she once made. She said, research is endlessly seductive. Writing is hard work. It is laborious, slow, often painful, sometimes agony. It means rearrangement, revision, adding, cutting, rewriting, but it brings a sense of excitement, almost rapture, a moment on Olympus. In short, it is an act of creation. Well, she put it so well. I mean, you know, the research is quite fun and you can always do more research, but what the bits I always find hardest is when I have to start writing and I often, I mean, I, I did a book on the outbreak of the First World War and I got quite worried because after three months, I still hadn't written anything. I'd sort of organized a lot of stuff. And I began to think, well, I ever write this wretched book. And then I started and I felt so much better, but it, it's an effort. And there are times you think it's just, I can't figure out where I'm going. I don't know, you know, what, what am I gonna do with this subject? But she is right, Barbara Tuckman. I think that, the, you know, when it all begins to work and you, you begin to sort of get it under control, it is quite exciting. But I usually become uh, not quite a hermit, but I'm not very good company because the trouble is your brain won't stop sort of mulling it over. Um, so you're not terribly much fun to be with. I think in your introduction to the book on war, you were saying at a couple points you felt stuck. I mean, was that the, the, the way of just trying to find some themes or ways to just to present the, the, the sort of many aspects of, you know, why individuals fight, why do societies fight, how do they fight? That, that was part of it. And, and when I did both the lectures and the book, I, I had a real problem in thinking, what am I going to write about in each chapter? How am I going to break it down? What are my main themes going to be? Because there's so many. And you, the danger is you get drawn into these fascinating sort of byways. I mean, I became very interested in, in the technology of guns, but most people are not going to want to read a lot about the move from, you know, the early arquebus to the musket, to the rifle, to whatever. Um, so I had to sort of pull myself back a bit. I mean, there were things that I got very interested in, but I realized, you know, the general reader is probably not going to want to have all the details of this and endless details about machine guns or whatever. Um, so you do have to, what I always try and do, and I, I have a lot of writers I've talked to do this, I try and keep in mind a reader, you know, who is my ideal reader? And it used to be my parents before they died because they were interested, but they were neither of them historians. 
And so I sort of kept them in mind as I was writing, what would they read and what wouldn't they read? And so I think I still do that, you know, who is going to read this? And so you, you have to tell yourself, you cannot go down that little alleyway, even though it's interesting. Well, in terms of your career, I mean, you've been a teacher, a researcher, a writer. You've also been involved in academic administration. You've been a warden and a provost. Do you find, I mean, how do these various aspects of your world's work? I mean, like, for example, when you're in an administration job, are you less likely to be working on a book? Uh, I've always tried to do both. And in both the administration jobs I had, I was head of a college at the University of Toronto, and then I was head of a college here in Oxford. When I was hired, I said, I do want to keep up my writing. And I do want that to be part of your expectation of me. And they were, they were nice enough that they agreed. And my last job at, at, um, in Oxford, I was there for 10 years, but I took a year off in between um, with their, you know, with their approval um, to, to work on a book on the First World War. So I knew there was no other way I was going to get it done. But I find it actually, it helps. If you're writing something, you, you keep in touch with the academic side of the job. And also I found sometimes my administrative jobs were quite helpful in what I was writing. I mean, when I was writing about the Paris Peace Conference, which is about negotiations and committee meetings, I thought, well, I thought of all the committee meetings I'd been in and how difficult it was sometimes to persuade people to do things. And so I think actually having been chair of a history department and then head of a college gave me a better sense of how the dynamics of, of meetings work and, and how difficult it can be sometimes to persuade people to do what you want to do. Well, in terms of, of future projects, I, I think I heard you say that you're one of the projects you have on the horizon is the, uh, the various peace conferences associated with World War II. Tell us about that project and what you're, what you're trying to look at and examine and, and, and figure out. Well, it's been a bit, thank you. It's been a bit on the back burner. Um, I, I started it, I was going to look at the World War II allied conferences during the war and, and taking it up to the end of the war. And so Yalta, for example, um, and then the, the, some of the couple of the ones, you know, some of the ones on the way. And I was, I think I started it, oh, probably 15 or so years ago. And then I was asked to do another book on the First World War. So I did that and then I did something else, but I have got a commitment to my publishers to do that. And I've collected quite a lot of material over the years and I'm very interested in it. I mean, it's another of those stories where you have extraordinary personalities dealing with great issues. So you have Winston Churchill, FDR, Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin, among others. So, you know, it, it, it's in itself, uh, I think, has some pretty good stories in it, but it's also very important because it really helped to plan both allied, allied strategy in the war, all these conferences, but also, of course, plan the post-war world. So I am slowly getting down to work on it, but I'm hoping my publishers aren't listening because they think I'm probably <laughs> too slow, so. Do you find it difficult to write about current events? I, I was uh, reading an essay uh, from Barbara Tuckman who said that she was talking about one project where she, uh, you know, she, she took it up to, it was actually on the Middle East and she took it right up to the present time. And she just, she said, I became so angry and so kind of emotionally invested that, you know, the, my last chapter's tone was so fundamentally different than the rest of the book that I, ultimately I just had to throw it away because I felt like, I was just too close to these events and I, I could not exert a more balanced judgment. I mean, how, how, how does that work for you? Yeah, that's very interesting. No, I know exactly what she means. I mean, as historians, we're always trying to look at the past dispassionately and whatever our own feelings are, we, we're, we're not there. I think most of us think we're not there as judges, although we may have strong views on what happened in the past. But in the present, when you're involved in it, it's very hard not to. I mean, I have been doing some journalism I've been writing articles for newspapers and, and I've been writing about what's going on at present, for example, responses to, to, the, to the COVID pandemic. And so there I do have stronger views and, and I think that's all right. I'm not writing the history. I'm, I'm writing as a concerned citizen today. Well, in fact, you have one of the lead articles in Foreign Affairs, this current edition, um, talking about you know, our current circumstances. And you talk very directly about the, the respect and the esteem that the United States has lost over these last couple of years. How, um, you know, how permanent is this? How, how, how significant of a, uh, of a hole has the United States dug itself into? It's hard to tell, but I'm one of the great assets the United States has had 
really in the 20th century and, and in the first part of the 21st century is, is its soft power. I mean, you, you know, you are an enormous military power. You're the biggest military power in the world and the biggest economy in the world. But what the United States also is, is a beacon for a lot of people. It's, it's a model for a lot of people. And a lot of people, as you know, want to come to the United States. And I think the influence of the United States has always been partly it's what political scientists call it soft power. The fact that people like it and admire its values and its hard power. I mean, and, and certainly we, I felt that as a Canadian. I mean, you know, we, we feel ourselves to be very, well, we are geographically close to the United States, but we're also your cousins in some ways. And we, we come out in some ways of a common past and, and a shared heritage. And I think the, yeah, you know, it happens at times, but I think the United States has, has behaved in ways in the world which have, have made people wonder if they want to emulate it anymore and wonder if it can be relied on anymore. I mean, the, the attacks by, by President Trump on NATO, for example, which, you know, for, it certainly has its faults, but the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has kept the peace and helped to keep the peace for a very long time. And so I think there is a concern that the United States is, is becoming a different country and, and is occupying a different place in the world. Now, we all know that that may be temporary. We all know that there are, in any country, there are many different currents of opinions and many different ways, you know, the countries are always working out what they are. And I think, you know, people around the world are watching this current election with great interest. I mean, it is an important election in a very democratic country. And I think how it turns out will, I think, be something that of course affects the citizens of the United States but also affects people living around the world. I think a lot of us um, have come to rely on the United States to provide a sort of moral and, and material leadership. Well, let me ask you finally, in terms of, uh, of your writing, um, um, you know, if there are students here who you know, have a, an interest in history, if you were to recommend some historians who combine both rigorous scholarship and also this kind of accessible, approachable, understandable writing style. I mean, if you had to recommend some authors for students to, uh, to study and, and, and review, who, who might you point to? Um, there are quite a few I can think of. I mean, I'd certainly point to Jill Lepore, um, who writes about American history and I think writes very well. Um, Maya Jasanoff, another woman historian who, who, who again writes um, very clearly and I think writes always with, with an eye on the general audience. Um, I'm trying to think of other historians. I admire Simon Sharma, who's written, among other things, on the French Revolution, an absolutely extraordinary book. Um, the late Tony Judd, who wrote a wonderful book on Europe after 1945. So there are around fantastic historians. And, and I think, you know, the best thing to do is pick up a book and see, see if you, could, you, you like it and you enjoy it and um, it makes sense to you. Well, let me ask you finally, when you're not working hard on history or managing a school or college, how do you relax? How do you unwind? I mean, you've mentioned that concert that was so inspirational for one of your first books, but how do you, do you kind of decompress? Well, when I can, I go out to concerts and I go to the opera, which I like very much. I go to movies a lot. Um, I mean, I have been watching movies at home, but it's not quite the same as going to a movie theater. I also read lots of, you know, non-history. Um, I read lots of mysteries. Um, for some reason, academics love mysteries, whether it's that we, you know, would like to murder our colleagues. I don't know. <laughs> every acad Almost every academic I know loves murder mysteries. And it's very odd, isn't it? Um, who are your favorite, so who are some of your favorite uh, authors in that genre? Um, Elmore Leonard, I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, great American writer. I mean, I think he, you know, to put, to say he's a mystery writer is actually not to do him justice. And I think he's an absolute, absolutely extraordinary writer. Um, Walter Mosley, another American writer who, who writes beautifully, I think. Um, John le Carré, the Englishman who writes, well, more spies than, than thrillers, um, all of them. Great. Good. Well, Professor McMillan, thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time. And again, for all of our listeners, I would urge you to, uh, to go to the bookstore and, and, and get Margaret McMillan books because they are just wonderfully interesting and readable and they're just really delights. So, Professor, thank you so much. And we, we will take you up on your offer to come to uh, uh, when travel allows to make your way to Southern Illinois. We'd love to show you around and, and show you a different part of the U.S. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to see it. It's not a part that I know at all. So I, I'd love to, and thank you very much. And, and 
the questions have been terrific and, and thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We will have a video of this interview on our YouTube channel on tomorrow. And we'd like to thank you again for following us on social media. And thank you for supporting the Institute for keeping the, the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.